Welcome to Thought Frontier. Welcome to the deep dive. Ready to go deep. Today we're diving into the world of quantum geometry. Quantum geometry. You might have heard about the quantum Hall effect, uh. or maybe seen some articles about wild new materials scientists are creating. Right. Well, today we're going to connect those dots. See, quantum geometry is like the secret sauce behind those materials. It's not like the geometry you learned in school, though. We're not talking about shapes and angles in the usual way. Okay, so not triangles and squares, then. Nope. Quantum geometry is more like a map, you know? Mm -hmm. But instead of streets and landmarks, it maps out how electrons behave inside these materials. It's a whole new way of looking at things. So it's like a roadmap for the quantum world. Exactly. And it helps us understand some of the craziest quantum stuff we're discovering. Like, imagine we want to design a material that conducts electricity with almost zero resistance. A superconductor. Yeah, like a superconductor. Quantum geometry can actually help us do that. It gives us a way to measure how easily those electrons can flow. So it's like finding the electron superhighway within a material. But how do we actually do that? How do we measure that flow? That's where something called the quantum metric tensor comes in. It's a bit of a mouthful. Yeah, tensor always makes my head spin a little. I know, right? But think of it like a tool that lets us measure the distance between different quantum states. Distance. But we're talking about electrons in a material. It's not like they're physically far apart. Right. It's not physical distance. It's more about how different the quantum information is between those states. Kind of like how different two points are on a map, but instead of miles, it's about quantum information. Okay, measuring distance in the quantum world. I think I'm starting to get it, but can we make this tensor thing a little less abstract? Sure, let's go back to that map idea. Instead of showing distances in miles, our quantum map shows us how much an electron's energy changes as it moves through the material. The bigger the energy difference, the further apart those quantum states are on our map. So the quantum metric tensor is like a tool that lets us calculate those energy differences. Exactly. And here's where things get really interesting. Remember, we're dealing with the quantum world. Things aren't always so simple. Turns out there's another piece to the puzzle, and it's called Berry Curvature. Berry Curvature. Okay, now you got my attention. What is that? Think about it like this. Every electron has a little arrow. It's called spin. Like a tiny compass needle. Exactly. And this arrow wants to align with magnetic fields. But in some materials, the spin gets twisted and turned as the electron moves around. So it's like the electron is on a roller coaster and its spin is getting all disoriented. Exactly. The Berry curvature is a way to measure just how much that spin gets deflected. And here's the thing. Berry curvature can actually create a kind of tilt in our energy landscape, making it easier for electrons to go in one direction than another. Oh, I've heard about this. It's like that analogy with a tilted pinball machine. You got it. And this tilting effect is actually at the heart of something called the nonlinear Hall effect. Nonlinear Hall effect. So what makes it nonlinear? Remember Ohm's law from high school physics? Vaguely. Something about voltage, current, and resistance. Exactly. It says that current is proportional to voltage, a nice straight line relationship. But in some materials, things get weird. The current doesn't just depend on voltage. It can also depend on the direction of the current itself, or even if there's a magnetic field nearby. So these materials are breaking the rules of classical physics. In a way, yeah. And those rule-breaking behaviors are super important because they tell us something really strange is going on at the quantum level. And in many cases, those strange effects are directly related to the quantum geometry of the material. Okay, so we've got this quantum map with its hills and valleys of electron energy. And we've got these spinning electrons getting twisted around by Berry curvature. Can you give us a real world example of all this? Like what kind of material actually shows these effects? Sure. Have you heard of tungsten ditelluride? It's WT2 for short. Tungsten ditelluride rings a bell. I think I've seen it mentioned in some tech articles. It's been making headlines because it has some really unusual electrical properties. And guess what? Those properties are strongly influenced by Berry curvature. So WT2 is like a poster child for quantum geometry in action. You could say that. In WT2, Berry curvature creates this sort of imbalance in the electron flow. It's like it makes it much easier for electrons to move in one specific direction. Huh, interesting. And scientists have actually built devices that use this effect. They're making new kinds of transistors and sensors. Wow. So by understanding the quantum geometry of a material like WT2, we can actually engineer its properties to our advantage. 
That's pretty amazing. But hold on, we talked about Barry curvature, but what about that other part of the quantum geometric tensor, the quantum metric? Does that do anything special too? Oh, it definitely does. You see, Barry curvature, that can be pretty dramatic with its effects, but the quantum metric, it's more subtle, but still really important. Okay, so remind me, how does that quantum metric thing work again? Remember we talked about the energy landscape? like a map with hills and valleys and how steep those changes are makes it hard for electrons to move around. Yeah, like the steeper the hill, the harder it is for those electrons to climb. All right. The quantum metric, it basically helps us measure how steep those hills are. It tells us how rough that quantum terrain is for those electrons. So a high quantum metric, that means rough terrain, tough going for the electrons. Exactly. And that usually means higher resistance, low quantum metric smoother ride, easier for those electrons to flow. Makes sense. So are there any materials where this quantum metric thing is really important? Oh, there are tons. But let's talk about one in particular. It's called manganese bismuth telluride, NNB2T4, if you want to get technical. Manganese bismuth telluride, huh? I'm not sure I've come across that one before. It's a mouthful, I know. But it's a really interesting material. It's what we call an antiferromagnetic topological insulator. Okay, now you're just using big words to scare me. Break that down for me. What does all that even mean? All right, all right. Imagine a material where the electrons are all lined up, but their spins cancel each other out. That's antiferromagnetism. Okay, I sort of remember that from physics class. Now add to that a special kind of surface where electrons can actually move freely. It's like a protected highway for them, all thanks to the topology of the material. That's the topological insulator part. So it's like this material has two sides to it. One side wants to block electrons. The other wants to let them flow freely. Exactly. And in this unique combination, that's where the quantum metric really shows its stuff. So what does it like pick a side, help one side win? Well, not exactly. Experiments have shown that MNB2T4, it actually has a type of nonlinear Hall effect, and this effect is directly tied to the quantum metric. Okay, so that nonlinear Hall effect again, and the quantum metric is involved somehow. And here's the kicker. This effect, it only shows up when we mess with the symmetries of the material. Symmetries, you mean like the shape? Well, kind of. In physics, symmetries are about how a system stays the same when you do certain things to it, like if you flip it over or rotate it. MNBTT4, it naturally has these things called time reversal symmetry and inversion symmetry. Time reversal. Like if you could rewind time, it would look the same. Exactly. And inversion symmetry means it looks the same if you flip it inside out. But we can break these symmetries. How do you break a symmetry? And why would we want to do that? Well, we can use things like magnetic fields or even engineer the structure of the material very carefully. And the reason we do it, yeah. because breaking those symmetries, it's like unlocking the true power of the quantum metric. It gets to show off what it can really do. Interesting. So how do we see that power in action? Scientists have observed a very specific pattern in the nonlinear Hall effect of MNBTT4. It's called a scaling law. And this law tells us that the effect is directly proportional to the quantum metric, not to anything else like the Berry curvature. It's like a signature, a fingerprint that tells us the quantum metric is responsible. So the quantum metric, it has its own unique effect, separate from the Berry curvature. Gotcha. So we've got WT2 with its Berry curvature weirdness and M and B2T4 showing off the quantum metric. Are there any other materials where these quantum geometry effects are important? Oh, absolutely. Loads of them. But you know what? Let's switch gears a little. I want to talk about something that seems kind of counterintuitive. Flat band superconductors. Flat band superconductors. Wait, doesn't that sound kind of, I don't know, contradictory? It does, right. Because usually for a material to be a good conductor, electrons need to be able to move around easily. Right. That's what conductivity is all about. Exactly. And in most conductors, electrons occupy energy bands that have a certain curvature to them. That curvature is what lets them respond to electric fields and flow as current. But in flat band materials, those energy bands are, well, flat, like a plateau. You'd think they'd be terrible conductors. So how can they be superconductors then? That doesn't make any sense. That's what's so cool about it. You see, th those flat bands, they actually make the interactions between electrons stronger. And sometimes those interactions can lead to a whole different way for superconductivity to happen. Not because of the curvature of the bands, but because of their quantum geometry. Quantum geometry, saving the day again. But how does that even work? Can you break it down for me? 
Think about those electron hops we talked about before. In a normal superconductor, electron pairs, they move together super smoothly, like a perfectly choreographed dance. Right, gliding along effortlessly. But in flat band materials, it's more like those electrons are all crammed together in a crowded room, bumping into each other. It's hard for them to move alone, but they can still flow as a group if they coordinate their movements. So like a more chaotic dance. Exactly. And you know what acts like the choreographer in this crazy dance? The quantum metric. It helps those electrons sync up and flow together as a supercurrent, even though they're stuck in those flat bands. Okay, I'm starting to see how this could work. But are there any actual examples of these flat band superconductors? Of course there are. And I bet you can guess what one of the most famous examples is. Let me guess. Twisted bilayer graphene. Bingo. That material, it just keeps on giving. Well, hold on. I thought the whole thing with twisted bilayer graphene was that it had those flat bands. Uh -huh. And we just said those flat bands should make it hard for electrons to move. So how can it be a superconductor? Because in this case, those flat bands are actually essential for superconductivity. It's like they create the perfect conditions for those electron pairs to form and start moving together. So the flat bands are both the problem and the solution. You got it. And here's another cool thing. The superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene is really tunable. We can change the twist angle, apply pressure, and that changes how strongly the electrons interact and even the quantum geometry of the bands. And that affects the superconductivity. So it's like we have a control knob for superconductivity. Mm. That's incredible. But how do we know for sure that the quantum metric is really the key player here? Well, scientists have actually measured something called the superfluid weight of twisted bilayer graphene. It's basically a way to measure how strong the superconductivity is. And they found that the actual superfluid weight is way higher than you'd expect if you only looked at the curvature of the bands. But when you include the contribution from the quantum metric, the predictions match the experiments perfectly. So it's like the quantum metric is the missing piece that explains why twisted bilayer graphene is such a good superconductor. Another win for quantum geometry. We've seen how it affects how electrons move in WT2, how it reveals itself in that nonlinear Hall effect in MNB to T4, and now it's even driving superconductivity in those flat band materials. Is there anything else that quantum geometry can help us understand? There is one more really cool area I want to touch on, fractional churn insulators. These are materials that behave like the quantum Hall effect, but without needing those super strong magnetic fields. Wait, the quantum Hall effect, but without a huge magnet? How is that even possible? Sounds crazy, right? But that's quantum mechanics for you, always pushing the boundaries of what we think is possible. And guess what? Quantum geometry plays a big role here too, especially the Berry curvature. It creates an effective magnetic field inside the material, even if there's no external magnet around. So the material basically makes its own magnetic field. That's wild. But why is this fractional quantum Hall effect so important, even if we can get it without the big magnet? Well, it's a really strange and cool phenomenon that lets us study these things called fractionalized particles. Fractionalized particles. Okay, now you're really losing me. I know, it sounds weird, right? But basically, it's like these particles carry a fraction of the charge of an electron. A fraction of an electron's charge. That's even weirder than quantum geometry. It is pretty mind-moggling, and it's one of the best examples we have of how electrons, when they act together collectively, can create these whole new types of particles called quasi-particles. So these fractional churn insulators, they give us a way to study those quasi-particle things without needing a giant magnet to do it. Exactly, and that's why scientists are so excited about these materials. They give us a way to explore some really fundamental physics and maybe even use these weird properties for new technology someday. This is all so fascinating, but I have to admit, my brain is starting to fry a little. Can we maybe take a little breather before we dive into those fractional churn insulators? Okay. Okay, I think my brain's rebooted. Ready to tackle those fractional churn insulators. All right, let's do it. You were saying they let us study those weird fractionalized particles without needing those massive magnets. Right. So where do we even start looking for such bizarre materials? Well, the search has led scientists to a fascinating class of materials called moiré materials. Moiré materials? Yeah, and I bet you already know one of them. Let me guess. Twisted by layer graphene. You got it. It seems like that material is good for just about everything these days. But hold on, I thought we were talking about ditching those giant magnets. Doesn't the quantum Hall effect, even the fractional kind, still need a magnetic field to work? You're right, a true fractional churn insulator should show those strange properties even without any magnetic field. And twisted bilayer graphene can get us pretty close. 
but it still needs a little magnetic nudge to get to that truly fractionalized state. So close, but no cigar. Yeah. Are there any materials that can do it without the magnetic help? The hunt is on, and there are some really promising candidates. One that's got everyone excited is Twisted Bilayer Molybdenum Detelluride, Moti 2 for short. Okay, so Twisted Bilayer Graphene and now Twisted Bilayer Moti 2. Are all twisted bilayers the key to these fractional churn insulators? Seems like twisting is a good price to start. It creates those flat bands that we know are so important for making those electron interactions stronger. Right, those flat bands that should make them bad conductors but somehow lead to superconductivity. <laughs> Quantum geometry is so weird. It really is. But it's not just about the twist. The materials themselves, their specific properties, they matter too. In MOTI2, the way its electrons are arranged and how its atoms are structured, well, it's like it was made to be a fractional churn insulator. So, MOTI2 was born to be fractionalized. But do we have any actual proof that it works? Oh, yeah. Scientists have done a ton of experiments on twisted bilayer MOTI2. One way they test it is by measuring the electrical resistance as they change the number of electrons in it. Usually, the resistance changes smoothly. But in MOTE 2, something really cool happens. The resistance flattens out, plateaus, at very specific values. What does that tell us? Those specific values, they correspond to those fractional fillings. You know, the ones that tell us those fractionalized particles are there. So it's like seeing those classic quantum Hall effect plots, but without needing that external magnetic field. Exactly. And there are other experiments that back this up, too. Researchers have used this technique called photoluminescence. They shine light on the material and look at what light comes back out. And guess what? They saw clear changes in the light at those same fractional feelings. It's like the material is shouting, look, I'm fractionalizing. That's amazing. So we've got multiple lines of evidence all saying the same thing. Twisted by layer Mote 2, it's the real deal. A genuine fractional churn insulator. Pretty cool, right? We started with this abstract idea of quantum geometry. And now we're talking about real materials with real world applications. It's been quite a journey. What are the big takeaways you want our listeners to remember from all of this? I think the biggest thing to take away is that quantum geometry, it's not just some theoretical idea. It's a powerful tool that helps us understand and even control how matter behaves at the tiniest level. We've seen how it affects how electrons move, how it can boost superconductivity, and even how it helps create those mind-bending fractionalized particles. Quantum geometry is like this secret code that unlocks a whole new world of possibilities in material science. That's a great way to put it. And it feels like we're just scratching the surface of what we can do with it. Any final thoughts to leave our listeners with? Well, we've mainly talked about how quantum geometry affects single electrons. But what happens when we think about a whole bunch of electrons interacting with each other? That's what we call many body quantum geometry. And it's a huge unexplored frontier just waiting for us to discover its secrets. Many body quantum geometry. Now there's something to ponder. Thanks for taking us on this incredible journey through the world of quantum geometry. It's been a wild ride. It's been my pleasure. Keep exploring and never stop asking those what-if questions. You never know what you might find. 